I'd like to call a public hearing to order to consider the leasing of property at Brookhaven Road and at Kilbourne Road to Vogue 13 LLC for a period of five years with nine five-year renewal terms. Roll call, please. Hood. Here. Thorstenson. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. O'Brien. Present. Bomas. Present. Five present. One absent. Sure. So you had a memo uh, in our packet from uh, my assistant, Jack Linhan, on this. He's really spearheaded the project from start to finish. This is something we've talked about for, I think, going on almost over a year, I know, from the staff perspective, probably a year or so with the village board. So Jack's going to uh, kind of run us through just as a reminder of the background information and then talk about uh, the bid and where we ended up and staff's recommendation to move forward. Okay. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Kvork and the village board. On July 2nd, 2018, I presented a proposal to auction off two municipal-owned towers. One tower is at 0 Brookhaven Road and the other is at 1151 Kilbourne. The towers were constructed by third parties and then turned over to the village in exchange for rent abatement. The space on the monopoles is leased to private cell carriers in exchange for annual rent revenue. The annual rent from these towers is approximately $98,500 a year. While there is additional room for more carriers, the village has been unsuccessful in securing additional leases. Additionally, the burden of tracking down annual payments for these towers has become unduly burdensome. For these reasons, the village entered into an agreement with Sell at Auction on January 3rd, 2019 for a commission of approximately 3% of the sale price. Following approval, Sell at Auction advertised and marketed the towers to the cellular industry and other capital invi investors. In total, the village of Gurney received 10 offers to purchase the tower. Of these offers, Vogue Tower Partners, LLC, provided the best proposal. On April 1, 2019, the Village Board approved a letter of intent with Vogue Towers for the sale of these towers and the consideration of a ground lease. Following the approval, the Village and Vogue Towers entered into a period of due diligence to ensure all assets are as advertised and are ready for sale. After working with the firm, we are confident tonight to present an asset purchase agreement and ground lease agreement to the Village Board for approval. 65 ILCS 511 of the Illinois Municipal Code requires a public hearing for any public leasing of property over 20 years in length. <coughs> the village has effectively noticed the public of this hearing with a notice in the Daily Herald on July 17th. It is also required to state the nature of the lease and the terms of, in consideration of the lease. The period of this lease agreement will be for five years with nine five-year automatic renewals. Effectively, this may be a 50-year lease. In consideration of this lease, Vogue Towers will furnish 50% of co-located tenant revenue from any additional new tenants that they secure on the towers. This amount is to increase annually by 2%. This is in addition to the asset purchase of the towers, which is a one-time consideration of sum of $1,450,000. Of this, a portion has been prorated rent for 2019 that has already been received by the village. Additionally, sell at auction will receive a commission of approximately $42,195 as the village's broker. 5% of the sale price, or $72,500, will be held in escrow account for a period of 18 months. Pending no issues or disputes, this amount plus any interest gained will be returned to the village. This amounts to a total of $1,290,871.68 to be received by the Village of Gurney for consideration of the ground lease and accompanying asset purchase agreement. I'm open to any questions or concerns at this time. Questions from the <coughs> trustees? Uh, we've talked about this a few times and sent Jack back to the drawing board. He's done an excellent job coming up with, uh, in my opinion, something that's fair for the two towers. If there's no questions, do I have a motion? Oh, we to have to open up to Oh, now. that's right. Okay. Um, if you'd like to give testimony on this topic with the cell phone towers, if you step to the microphone, our village attorney will swear you in. All right. Close the floor. <laughs> I close the floor to the public about cell phone towers. Motion uh, approved. I have a motion to recommend. Motion to recommend. I have a motion from Trustee Thorstenson, a second from Trustee Ross to recommend this contract as presented uh, at our regular meeting in 10 minutes. Roll call. Hood. 
Yes. Thorstensen. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Six aye. All right. <coughs> That's the only matter we had scheduled for a public hearing. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion second. from Trustee Balmas, second from Trustee Garner. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we'll reconvene. I'd like to call, I'd like to call the Gurney Village Board regular meeting of August 5th, 2019 to order. Roll call please, Andy. Hood. Here. Thorsonson. Here. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. O'Brien. Present. Balmas. Present. Six present. All right, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we start our agenda tonight, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for the senseless, senseless violence experienced in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio. Um, it impacts all of us, and I'd like us to remember the families, the victims, the families, and their friends. I'd also like us to include in our thoughts and prayers our own public safety officers who are on the front line in defending this community. Uh, I know they plan and they practice, um, but we want God's speed for them too. So please join me in a moment of silence. Okay. Thank you. All right, our first item of business tonight is approval of the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion, motion by second. Trustee Balmas, second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Yes. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Six aye. All right, motion carries. Patrick, please read the consent agenda into the record. Item number one, approval of the minutes from the July 15, 2019 Village Board meeting. Item number two, approval of requests from Mayor Kavark to attend the 2019 Smart City Expo in Atlanta, Georgia from September 11 through 13, 2019 at a cost not to exceed $1,800. Item number three, approval of recommendation from Public Works Department to award the Northwestern Water Tower Backup Generator Project to the low bidder Peeper Power and the amount of $29,350. Item number four, approval of recommendation from the Public Works Department to award the South Storage Building Trench Drain Replacement Project to the low bidder, Camozzi Construction, and the amount of $37,000. Item number five, approval of setting a bid date of August 23, 2019 for 2019 Police Mobile Data Computer Replacement Project. Item number six, approval of, fire, of a fireworks permit for the Gurney Days on August 10, 2019. Item number seven, approval of payroll for the period ending July 19, 2019 in the amount of $868,734.99. Item number eight, approval of bills for period ending August 5, 2019 in the amount of $1,735,461.03. Item Thank you, Patrick. Do I have a motion to approve the so consent moved. agenda as read into Second. the record? Motion by Trustee Balmas. Second. Second by Trustee Thorstenson. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Six aye. All right, motion carries. Move on to petitions and communications. And we are extremely delighted and honored to have a proclamation honoring our very own Trustee Cheryl and her husband Dave uh, Ross for being selected the 2019 Gurney Days honorees. And I'll read the proclamation into the record. For the past 47 years, the Gurney Days Corporation has selected a deserving individual or couple to be honored during the annual Gurney Days celebration. And the Gurney Days Corporation 
has selected Cheryl and Dave Ross as the 2019 Gurney Days honorees. And the Gurney Village Board wishes to recognize that Cheryl and Dave, Cheryl and Dave as longtime residents, volunteers, and community leaders. And both Cheryl and Dave served Lake County students for over 35 years in their professions. Cheryl as a teacher at Woodland District 50 and Dave as a counselor at the College of Lake County. And Cheryl began a long career of local government service in 1999 as a member of the Village of Gurney Plan Commission, is currently serving her fourth term as village trustee, and represents Gurney in her role as chairperson of the board of directors of the Lake County Vent Convention and Visitors Bureau, Visit Lake County. Dave has taught Sunday school at their local Bethel Lutheran Church for 25 years and has served as a past president and board member of the Cool Ministries Food Pantry and Transitional Housing Program. Cheryl is the daughter of former Gurney Mayor Gordon Jillings, the very first Gurney Days honoree, and her commitment to the residents of the village of Gurney continues to be in the spirit of her father. And Cheryl and Dave spent countless hours sourcing material and leading the project efforts to bring the Richard A. Welton Village Plaza to fruition to commemorate former Mayor Dick Welton's vision to make Gurney a community of opportunity. And together, Cheryl and Dave has, have made a profound impact on Gurney in a multitude of ways through their commitment to service and community betterment. And in the tradition of the Gurney Days honoree, Cheryl and Dave Ross are stellar examples of the very best of Gurney and a reflection of the values of the community that we all call home. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of Trustees of the Village of Gurney that Thursday, August 8, 2019, be recognized as Cheryl and Dave Ross Day throughout the Village of Gurney be it further proclaimed that the village congratulates Cheryl and Dave Ross on their selection as the 2019 Gurney Days honorees and that a copy of this proclamation be presented to the couple at a dinner in their honor on Thursday, August 8, 2019. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. second. I have a motion from Trustee Garner, second from Trustee O'Brien. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Do you want to make a speech? Okay. <laughs> I didn't think so. Thursday. <laughs> yeah, Thursday night you'll have to. All right. And we have another um, honor, more honors to hand out tonight. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Chief Smith and Deputy Chief Gonzalez. Uh, to recognize some very, very important contributors. I picked up this instead of the microphone. Oh. Oh. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor, Mr. Mutes, and Village Board. Uh, it's our pleasure to stand before you tonight. Uh, Cheryl and David, congratulations. It's a great honor. Uh, we're very fortunate to, to come in front of you and, and congratulate uh, two office, or two employees of our department. A one police officer and one records assistant uh, on their selections for the police officer of the year and the civilian of the year in the Gurney Police Department. So again, I want to thank the board for giving us this opportunity to stand in front of you and recognize them. I'd like to also thank the Gurney Days Corporation as uh, they've granted us the uh, uh, pleasure of allowing those two employees to lead the Gurney Days Parade. And I'd also like to thank the uh, Exchange Club as they will be issuing an award later in the year in November uh, for both of these. So just to give you a little bit of background on this process, uh, employees are nominated for uh, police officer of the year and civilian of the year uh, by their fellow employees, um, sometimes by supervisors. That nomination process goes to the awards committee. The awards committee is headed up by Deputy Chief Jesse Gonzalez, and there are, uh, it is uh, included in their peers and a group of supervisors. Uh, there's a presentation that uh, takes place and then there is a vote that occurs, and uh, one person is selected as the police officer of the year, and one person is selected as the civilian of the year. 
Uh, this year's Police Officer of the Year is, is Pat Murray. So Pat, if you could come forward, please. <clears throat> Give you a little bit of background about Pat. Uh, Pat started his policing at a community to, uh, to the west of us in 2003. In 2016, we were lucky enough to bring him aboard here at the Gurney Police Department, and he's been with us uh, for the last three years. Uh, he's made a big impact in those three years, uh, as I will get to in some of the, as I read a few expert excerpts from his nomination. Uh, but just want to share a little bit more with you. Uh, currently for the Gurney Police Department, he's with the uh, he serves as a uh, representative on the major crash assistance team. That's a Lake County uh, crash assistance team, assistant team that is made up of accident investigators and accident reconstructionists from, around, from different departments around the county. And they come together when there's a serious accident where they have to investigate a fatal crash. Um, and they also assist with the uh, homicide investigations for the Lake County Major Crime Task Force. He's a drone pilot for our, uh, our drone program here. He's uh, the Fraternal Order Police Social Lodge Sergeant at Arms. He was also a contract negotiator, uh, negotiator for uh, the, the Fraternal Order Police. He's a crisis intervention team officer and, uh, and he's currently a field training officer here in Gurney. Uh, Pat was nominated uh, by one of the supervisors in our, in our department and I just wanna highlight a few of those things. Uh, in this nomination, uh, it talks about how Pat was uh, selected uh, to attend a three-day Illinois Association of Traffic Crash Investigators Conference in Springfield in 2018. He's established a reputation within the county through the Major Crash Assistance Team Program as a go-to person for crash data retrieval, which is the black boxes that are in, in vehicles. It should, be, it should also be noted that earlier this year, uh, Pat was selected as the NK, MCAT Rookie of the Year for that program and received an award a few months ago. Uh, he is one of the leaders in self-initiated activity and traffic enforcement on his team. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he, was, he is a crisis intervention officer and one of his duties is uh, uh, to respond to uh, people that are in crisis and, and try to de-escalate the situation. So I wanna read a, a short little uh, summary here of an incident that he was, uh, he and several other officers were involved in where there was a subject inside the residence uh, uh, doing some damage. Uh, that subject was also brandishing a large kitchen knife. Uh, Officer, Mur Officer Murray arrived on scene. He engaged the individual in conversation for approximately 40 minutes. Uh, eventually was able to calm the person down and uh, ask the person to exit the house, which he did so on his own and surrendered into police custody where we were able to provide that person some help without any force being, uh, being used. On the investigation side, uh, he was working a burglary case involving some subjects in, uh, in one of our hotels. Uh, he was able to, to, to get a picture of the offender. He, was, he distributed that throughout the uh, area, able to ID, uh, identify the person get a warrant, and then that person was later taken into custody here in our town uh, in the act of committing further crime. He's also a child safety technician and he gives presentations regularly to community groups and, and participates in a number of charity and community events. Uh, we're very honored that you uh, are here with this department and that you're in front of us today to accept the, uh, the award with your family. So our 2018 Officer of the Year, Pat Murray. Last but not least is our civilian of the year uh, is Julie Lambrick. She's our records assistant. So Julie, could you please join us in the front? <laughs> J 
Julie's been employed by the Gurney Police Department since 2004, so she's, work, she's worked with us for the last 15 years. She is a records assistant, and some of her duties, uh, if any, anybody's ever visited the, the police department during normal business hours, you see that the, there's a, a group of employees that are sitting in the window uh, greeting people as they walk into the lobby. Uh, they have a number of other responsibilities that include uh, processing reports, processing citations, uh, FOIA, uh, paperwork, and, and a whole bunch of other things that I could stand up here for probably the next <coughs> 10 minutes trying to explain. Uh, but they are a very busy uh, group of employees, and Julie stands out as, as somebody that we trust and somebody that we can go to uh, when we need some assistance. She's also taken it upon herself to assist in the training of uh, three new records employees this year. And so uh, Julie's taken a first, uh, first-hand uh, role in that as she's trained the other three uh, employees to, to help bring them up to speed and, and get things done there in, in the records division. Um, before I get into the, uh, the nomination, uh, Julie was nominated by two different Gurney Police Department employees. Um, and so, if I, if I could, I'm going to read a, just a quick summary of each of those nominations. Of the four records assistants that started the year, one was promoted and two others retired. This put a lot of extra strain on Julie with the additional workload that fell on her. Julie has accepted the extra burden without complaint and has worked hard to make sure that division's responsibilities continue to be met. This has meant long days, extra hours, beginning and end of her workday, as well as coming in on the weekend for overtime on her days off. She's an exceptional resource to the new records supervisor during her first year. Julie's assisted many important duties throughout the year, uh, including revamping the records assistance training program and playing an important role in providing training needed to the three new members of the division, all while maintaining her own duties. It should also be noted uh, that Julie has served with the Fraternal Order Police uh, Social Lodge for a number of years. She's currently the treasurer and she's heavily involved in the, all of the community activities uh, that the Social Lodge is involved in. And so our 2018 Civilian of the Year, Julie Lambert. Thank you. All right, and on behalf of the Village Board, thank you for your commitment, your dedication, everything you do. You make the community safer for all of us, uh, what you do every day. So we're very appreciative, well-earned recognition. So congratulations. All right, that's the end of petitions and communications tonight. Any reports? No. All right, old business? No. All right, then we will start with new business. The first item is approval of ordinance 2019. 51. 51, authorizing the execution of an asset purchase agreement between the Village of Gurney and Vogue Tower Partners, LLC, for the sale of two village cell towers located at 0 Brookhaven Road and 1151 Kilbourne Road, Gurney, Illinois. So this was the topic of our discussion. So anything to add? Sure, no. Jack went over this during our uh, public hearing earlier tonight. So the first ordinance is the sale <laughs> of the assets, the two cell towers. The second is a ground lease, so they're able to access the towers themselves. Um, as Jack covered earlier, uh, the total was 1.45 million uh, minus commission, uh, minus rent we've already been paid, and then $75,000 held in escrow for the purchase of the assets. For the ground lease, uh, it is 50% of uh, any new co-located revenue on there with a 2% annual escalator. All right, questions? If not, do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Wait, is that a question? All right, I have a question from Trustee Thorstenson. It's actually a comment. I just wanted to really commend Jack and Brian and, and 
Pat on this one. But this is an asset that was very intriguing to all of us and kind of complex and thinking, could we really sell this? And they said, let's bring it to market and see. So I think it was a very um, ingenious way of recapping that capital now before it doesn't have a value on it in the future. I just wanted to add that on. Thank you. And I had a motion, I believe, from Trustee Garner. Correct. Second from Trustee Ross. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Bombus. Aye. Six aye. All right, motion carries. The second item is related, approval of ordinance 2019-52, authorizing the execution of a ground lease agreement between the Village of Gurney and Vogue Tower Partners, LLC, with respect to property located at 0 Brookhaven Road and 1151 Kilbourne Road, Gurney, Illinois. Motion to approve. So moved. Motion second. by Trustee Balmas. Second. I had a second from Trustee O'Brien. Sorry, Greg. Sorry. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Six aye. All right. Motion carries. I bet Jack's very relieved. <laughs> All right. Item number three, approval of ordinance 2019-53 granting a major modification to the special use permit for 1700 Nations Drive pursuant to the Gurney Zoning Ordinance. <coughs> mm. Pat will fill us in and we have Steve Jacobson here uh, from Great Wolf Lodge. So um, we'll go over what we're discussing. Sure, so uh, this was before the village board a couple <laughs> months ago on a temporary basis. Uh, Great Wolf came before the board, um, asked him to do a trial period to sell day passes uh, within certain parameters that were set. Uh, the village board granted that 45 day uh, temporary uh, sale of the passes to see how it goes. Uh, while that process uh, was going on, they were the Great Wolf worked through the Planning and Zoning Commission for a major amendment to a special use permit to allow this con to continue on um, in perpetuity. Uh, they were before the PZB on July 17th, uh, following testimony and uh, one comment from a resident in the area uh, that showed support for it. The Planning and Zoning Board uh, is forwarding a favorable uh, unanimous uh, recommendation on it. So as we discussed earlier on, there are parameters set upon it uh, to make sure it, it stays under control. We don't run into issues with occupancy loads uh, or parking. So that is memorialized in the ordinance itself. Um, Steve Jacobson is here uh, with Great Wolf and I believe he has uh, some information to share as far as uh, how it's gone today. Yeah, just, just update us on how the temporary period went. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Village Board, uh, Village Administrator. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, we were, when we were here last, a uh, couple of things that were important to us, just to refresh your memory. <clears throat> we measured the constraints, you know, parking, front desk arrival experience, was that affected? How did people pick up their tickets? Uh, how did we control admissions into the water park for safety reasons? Were there any seating challenges or other thing with our F and B? And then just the overall water park activities, uh, which you can see on the bottom, the guest experience or our NPS, which is really how did the customers experience? How, you know, did, was any of what we've done affect that? And uh, the answers to all of these questions is where uh, everything went according to plan. Uh, next slide. So, uh, so since the temporary approval, uh, there's been no issues with the operations of the lodge or reduction in our scores. The online booking has been in sync with occupancy levels as we discussed earlier. Uh, we drove more sales to rooms. So if you remember, we put a floor of $40 for the day passes. We have kept them between $50 and 75, depending if it's the trough period. And we've actually been driving more people to room sales than day passes, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, the day passes throughout the portfolio have averaged between 0.08% to 2.7. Uh, Gurney, uh, the Gurney Lodge through June 20th through the 31st is on the higher end, about 2.1%. So that represents about 713 day passes in that time frame. Uh, the passes were as low as $50 through the trough periods and $75 for peak weekends. Um, again, we based it on room rates, so it ended up being a better deal to purchase the room if you have a family of four or five, which was our ultimate goal, than the day passes. Uh, 
The other thing that's not shown on here as far as uh, not only the sales tax generated by the day passes, we've also seen as the day passes have peaked, we've also seen a peak in our F&B and our retail and the Family Entertainment Center. So all in all, it hasn't affected anything related to parking, how people experience the lodge, but we've drove, driven more sales and more importantly kept people working in the trough periods, which is always a challenge in this business at the same time generate more sales tax for the village. So um, again, this is just the guidelines which uh, uh, Patrick talked about earlier. Um, these are all the terms and conditions that we held to during this, that uh, trial period. So um, I'll be quiet and see if there's any questions. <laughs> all right, anyone have any questions uh, for Patrick or for Steve? You got a comment. Okay. I would just like to say thank you for the uh, thoroughness of the presentation. It was oh. very professional and helped us to make an intelligent decision that is good for the, the residents, uh, Great Wolf Lodge, and the village at large. So um, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, one last thing, too, is most, I would say, not, about 95, 96% are from this zip code. So it's really doing what it's supposed to do. It's the local residents are getting the opportunity to do day passes and not spend the night if they don't want to. So Yeah, I talked out. about I did the um, Heather Ridge Homeowners Association on Tuesday, and, you know, it's over 55, and I said, when your grandchildren come, now you can enjoy the Great Wolf Park. And just so, to remind everybody, we also do companion passes. So um, if you have a relative that's staying in the lodge, they can get a companion pass, so you're able to join them as well. So anyway, thank great you very deal. much. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, do I have Make a motion, motion to approve? Motion by Second. Trustee Balmas, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorsonson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Six aye. All right. You're in business. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Motion carries with item number four. Approval of ordinance 2019. 54, amending Chapter 78 of the Gurney Municipal Code by amending Section 78-41 entitled Use of Motor Vehicles for Unlawful Purposes and repealing Section 78-73 entitled Use of Mobile Electronic Devices Prohibited While Operating a Motor Vehicle. Sure. So the next two items on the agenda are police department related. So I'm going to have Chief Smith walk us through both of these. Yeah, thank you. For, uh, thank you, Mr. Mutes, uh, Madam Mayor and, and Board. Uh, <clears throat> uh, these are two updates that we're uh, proposing changes to the ordinances. Uh, the first one is, is related to the use of motor vehicles for un unlawful purposes. We have an administrative seizure program in place here in the village of Gurney. Whereas uh, if your driver's license is suspended or revoked for certain offenses, uh, we do place a, an administrative seizure on your vehicle uh, in the amount of $500 for certain violations up to $750 for alcohol or driving under the influence re related violations. Uh, historically, uh, we have kept those violations or the reasons for the administrative uh, seizure uh, strictly related to uh, traffic safety related offenses. Um, recently, uh, on July 1st, the state of Illinois added a section that, to the authorized administrative seizure process for failure to pay child support. Uh, we historically have not seized vehicles for administrative uh, injunctions. Uh, similar, the state also allows for the seizure for a couple of other things, uh, failure to pay uh, parking tickets, um, the, the child support offense here and admissions uh, in Gurney. We have not administratively seized vehicles for those reasons. And so we're here in front of the board to, uh, to request that we would continue with that process and we would uh, eliminate or add uh, in the failure to pay child support as a excluding factor in the administrative process. Be happy to answer any questions related to that if anybody has any. You can't renew your license plate without the emission testing. So are they driving on an expired license plate too? So oftentimes what happens is somebody's driver's license will be suspended because it is related to a license plate of a vehicle that they have registered in their name. But it's not necessarily that they're driving that vehicle. They may be driving a different vehicle. Okay. 
I got gotcha. you. But you would you would generally be correct, Madam Mayor. Okay. Me? Question, Trustee O'Brien. I just have one that's sort of related to this in the next section of it. Also, I understand July first. Now, if you have three moving violations for touching your phone, you have it's a moving violation. So then you have a suspended license. Will that somehow be impacted by one of these uh, seizure rules? So, it, so I'm going to talk about the moving violation for electronic devices here in a second. Um, but it, it does now become a, a generalized moving violation in the state of Illinois for uh, using your cell phone while driving. There are some exceptions. There are safety exceptions built into that statute for uh, calling 911 or notifying uh, of an emergency. Uh, if your vehicle is stopped and in park, uh, you may use your phone. Uh, but it has become a moving violation and therefore no longer enforceable under our ordinance violations. And so we're here in front of the board to ask that that be removed from the enforcement mechanism uh, of the ordinance violations. Generally, or specifically to your question, uh, there is a process in place to suspend your vehicle for multiple violations of that offense. Uh, and, and you have to forgive me, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it's two or three. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So basically we're removing it under our ordinances and going along with the state so it can be a moving violation. Our ordinances aren't moving violations. Thank you. Questions? Do I have a motion to approve both changes? So moved. Motion by Trustee Garner. Second. Second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Six aye. Thank you. All right. Motion carries. Next is item number five, approval of recommendation from the police department to purchase, to purchase 24 in-car video systems and related services for Gurney police squads from Axon Enterprise, Inc. at a five-year total cost of $183,187 and 20 cents. Okay. Chief? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the, the, as, as most of the board knows, the, each one of our squad cars has a mobile data computer inside it now. Uh, attached to that mobile data computer is a in-car camera system. It's an all-in-one system that includes the camera and the computer. Uh, at the end of this fiscal year, Windows 8, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of this calendar year, Windows 8 will become unsupported and we will need to upgrade the computers in the, uh, in the vehicles. Um, part of that process is going to be having a separate computer and a separate camera system. And so this, this request here is related to the camera systems. Uh, real quickly, I'd like to thank uh, IS Director Chris Velkover and, and Sergeant Mike Mann. I think he, he, he was here earlier, but he may have left. They did a lot of work on this project. Uh, what we did was we brought in multiple vendors um, of, of in-car camera systems uh, related to police vehicles. Uh, we, we listened to their presentations. Uh, we gathered data. Um, we did some research by speaking to other uh, departments in the area. Uh, as you know, we have Axon body cameras on all of our officers right now. And this Axon product is their sister to that body camera. It's the in-car camera system that works in conjunction with the body camera. Um, and also, it, uh, it's, in, it's included in, in, in evidence.com, which is the program that stores all of that data. Um, so there's one microphone, two cameras. They automatically sync with each other. The camera in the car and the camera on the officer, um, they sync up automatically as soon as they're activated. Um, so again, we felt like this was the best product on the market uh, by far. Uh, and the cost for this, uh, this program is spread out over five years. It's five payments instead of one large lump sum payment. Um, and we felt this was the best product for us, for our agency. We did do some uh, testing uh, in-house. We had a uh, in-car camera from Axon put into one of our squad cars and it rotated through the fleet with the officers that were asked to drive it on a daily basis and, and provide their feedback. And uh, it got uh, raving reviews. And so we're, we're before you today to ask for the approval to purchase those camera systems. Questions for the trustees? All right, I have one. Sure. Um, 
As part of our due diligence, do we have a formal vendor risk assessment process? It looks at financial security. Brian. I, yeah, I, I was looking at Director Brokover for some assistance. I, I, I'm not sure if we have a risk assessment. Uh, we do receive multiple uh, uh, requests uh, on this process. We got multiple quotes. Yeah, I'm more interested, and it only caught my attention because now they have our body cams, our computers, mm -hmm. and everything. So do we look at the firm's financials and, and you know, the risks that they, you know, things that would represent a risk if there was an issue with the vendor on us? I mean, do we do go through any kind of vendor risk? I'm not the expert, mm -hmm. uh, Kate, our Trustee Thorstenson, that's really kind of more her field, but I, do we have something already in place? So if, if I could, just a, for yeah. a piece of clarification. I've never heard of this company either, so it's. Just for a, a piece of clarification, it's the body cameras and in-car camera system. Yeah. It is not the computer system. Uh, okay. So it's, it's the two cameras. Yeah, so Axon was for, formerly Taser International. So this is okay. So they just changed their name. Cause I was like, big player on the block as far as okay. uh, the body cameras. Obviously, they have the tasers. Um, have moved it in the in car. So it's a formal risk assessment for vendors. We don't have a formal program that we go through. But Axon is a major player in the market. Okay. Well, I feel so if something now. happened to them, okay. there'd be a lot of police departments across the country and probably across the world that would be hurting pretty bad. Yes. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it would just with. You know, the amount of communities that have been hacked through no fault of their own, and I know you do a good job with that. And maybe we're getting to a point with some of these vendors where we need to have a more formal vendor risk assessment where we look sure. at more than just can they do the job, but do the job in the future and any risks that it may bring to us, especially financials and stuff. We're investing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Something okay. to think about for the future. Yeah, sometimes Understood. we get certifications from them about their firewall protection and yeah, things like that. That's, yeah, that's all part of a vendor risk ass are, are assessment. Are we talking about security assessment of the vendor? Or well, that would be part of it. That, that's all part of a formal vendor risk. It has multiple pieces. It would involve multiple, but it just means we've looked at it beyond just with the product itself. It's a good fit. Right. Their finances, any risks yeah, they we, have. We, what, we can speak to the security side of it, but not the financials. From that. Yeah, so it, it's a joint thing. So we'll work on that mm -hmm. in the future. but. Um, with all the stuff going on with security and companies coming and going, we may want to get a little more formal. But this is a good, good fit. I, I like the name Taser International. That rang a bell. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Do I have a motion to Make approve? Make a motion to approve. Motion by Trustee Balmas. Second. Second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Balmas? Aye. Success. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. All right. We do need to go into executive session, but before we do that, I will open the floor to public comment. If you'd like to come to the microphone, state your name. Your address is optional. Good evening, Earl. My name is Leonard Petrovic. 3712 Grove. I have a comment. I, I, I was here a year and a half ago or so about the similar situation on the corner of Grove Avenue and Bell Plain. It's a stop sign. It's a corner house. The driveway exits on Bell Plain, 100 feet away from the corner. When I come up to the corner to stop, there's a white line. There's a stop sign. You have to stop there. You look to the right, you can see an eighth of a mile or more. You look to the left, you can see 100 feet. Now, three or four times, I've almost been hit broadside because you can't see past the cars that are parked at the end of the driveway beyond their property line. They're up close to the edge of the road. And I brought this to your attention before, nothing has ever been done. So what I would like would be to invite all of you up there within the next month to come to my street, come up to that corner, stop at the corner, look to your right, you can see eighth of a mile, look to your left, you can see maybe a hundred feet. Oh, but before you do that, put your children and or grandchildren in the car with you. 
because if you do get hit from the side, it's going to be on the driver's side. And uh, uh, nothing has been done. It seems to be getting worse. Can you park beyond your property line on your driveway up to the edge of the road? Is that legal? I, we did send staff out there last year, and I forget, I'm drawing a blank as to what, there wasn't anything illegal, right? I've, I've been up there myself. I pulled up, stopped at the stop sign. There was enough room to pull ahead before you were into traffic on Bell Plain to see, to clearly enter the intersection. Yeah. I so got pictures on my phone. My kids told me, take pictures in case something happens. You're going to get in a wreck. You're going to get hurt or worse. So I got I, I will I will drive out there, but we did send staff last year, and they did do pictures, and we got a write up on it that it's designed and working the way it's supposed to. But I will go drive it and look myself. I promise. Okay, it's not all the time. It may be 75 percent of the time you come to the corner, you can't see around the cars. Now today there was they were parked way up off the line, but for the most part you cannot see more than 100 feet around the corner. And if you stop properly and make a, a turn into the intersection and make a left turn, you're, you've had it. I, I will, I'll go look and I'll talk to staff again and I wish everybody in town would be as diligent about stopping as you are. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Village Board. Thanks for allowing me to have a few minutes of your time. Uh, I'm here with my wife tonight. We live at uh, Cheswick Drive over near the Bittersweet Golf Course, just across from the eighth hole. So if you can picture that, if you know the course, there's a pond in between us and the eighth hole. And when we moved in 1994 here, uh, at that time, we paid a premium on the lot because the lot was backing up to the golf course, had a beautiful pond. This is the Concord Oaks subdivision. So uh, very nice subdivision. We've loved it. Been here 25 years now and really enjoy it. But as you can see from the pictures, our pond is just about gone. <laughs> and it's really alarming to us. Two years ago, there's pictures of our pond that are absolutely gorgeous, wildlife, the whole works. Two years, the same month, there's lily pads and practically no water. We've talked to the golf course about it because at one time the golf course was obviously private. We never had the problem when they were private. I don't know if it's an issue with the village or not. What the golf course has told us is that they're pumping the water out of the ponds to irrigate the golf course. And hence, we're having a problem with that last pond because we're at the end of the food chain. The problem is it takes away from the beauty. We've lost the wildlife. We, we feel like we're losing property value as well because you can walk across our pond now, and it's very scary. Your timing is impeccable. Um, Patrick and I and a couple other employees actually drove, not walked, all 18 holes. Um, yes, the village took over ownership. We're very happy with the golf management, but we have recognized that there may be some capital investment we need to do to keep the golf course you know, at a certain level. It's an asset. What, what I, what we came to realize, it's an asset, um, and that requires some investment. It's not just a matter of running the golf course, and, and Golf Vision is doing a good job with the greens and that, but there's more to it. So I have, Pat and I have decided that we're gonna take one of our Committee of the Whole meetings in the fall, because it's more than just the ponds. And I did notice that pond when, when we took our drive. So there's, there's things that we need to talk about and make some decisions as a board, um, because there's a cost to that and it would come out of our capital improvement budget, but with some direction from the board, then staff can plan. So we, this was just was like a month ago, a month ago we were out there. So. Yeah, and I have talked to the superintendent about the duckweed issues out there at some yeah, ponds. So. There's a couple different options. As you said, all these ponds are connected together and drained mm -hmm. into the irrigation pond, so we can't do something that's gonna affect the water that they irrigate the golf course with and burn up the golf course. So more long-term options are something that you typically do at the end of the season or the beginning of the season. Anything we do short-term 
is going to take care of it for a month or so and then it's going to be back and that's money wasted so it is something that we're talking to the superintendent of grounds about on a larger scale out there yeah so we, yep. we need to look, kind of look at the bigger pictures a lot of things and, and some of these are immediate but it takes some investment so we need to discuss that as a board so we'll probably be doing that october Maybe. Yeah, probably towards the end of the season, so we yeah. can get them here so, as well. But there's quite a few cosmetic things and you know, trees. I, we noticed quite a few things that just yeah. we need to address in the pond. Well, any consideration you can give it, we'd really appreciate. Yeah, no, we want we so. we want to keep the, the course. It's the most beautiful piece of property that is in this village. It's absolutely gorgeous. We want to keep it that way. We want golfers, and certainly it's a nice amenity for the neighborhood. So, okay. your timing's good. We a little late to the table on it, but. We're on it now. Thank you. Thank you All for right. consideration. Okay. Just one more issue, and that happens to be close to us as well, the brand new roundabout, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which, which I wonder sometimes about the name. Hey, because don't we have a roll about one issue at a time? <laughs> <laughs> this will be quick. Um, no, I... It's, we're very concerned. It's a death trap. It really is, and I don't mean to say it in that direction. Yeah, I wouldn't so say it's quite accidents. that, but yes, we have... It's doing some of the things we wanted it. It's achieving some of our goals, which we have reduced traffic on Almond and Data, less cut through, and the, and the average traffic, you know, we've had the cameras out there off and on, different times, long periods of time. The average speed is down on Data and Almond, but we, we do seem, there's, it does seem to be some difficulty <coughs> for some people to understand the yield, and, and then it, it just kind of snowballs. So we have, we have new striping. We're gonna get a little bit more in your face about the instructions, doing some striping, some different speed signage out there. Um, those are the two big ones. Yeah, those are the two big ones, and then and we're continuously evaluating it. So it's not off our radar by any means. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, people either seem to love it or hate it, and the ones that hate it just won't yield. Um, and so we, we're trying. We're, we're, we've got some improvements planned for it. So. One we're thing I've seen out. effective in other roundabouts like that would be a speed bump right before you enter because it does, it forces you to at least slow down and go over that speed bump. Yeah, I don't know that we would do a speed bump. We've talked about speed tables, but then we get into a huge issue in the winter with snow and ice control. So yeah. there's some trade-offs. So, so we have looked at it. Um, we have someone in uh, our police department that's doing a lot of research on, did a lot of research for us on some ways we can improve the signage and and different things we can do. We're gonna try those and keep measuring it. So we'll, we'll, we'll get it right. Okay. Um, the alternative is a traffic light and we don't wanna do that. Right. No, no you're not at the microphone, ma'am. Possibly a flashing yellow or flashing red? Something I think, to... What's, the, what's involved with the new signs? So the speed there? signs are radar speed signs that have the speed set. And if you come up to it and you're going over it, they flash at you. We're looking at those at all four approaches. Perfect. Public Works Department has got costs on it. Um, so it's a matter of ordering the signs and getting them installed. So that's in process. The striping, when our pavement striping contractor is in town in the next month or so and doing everything else, we'll have them out there doing some additional pavement markings as well. And then okay. as the mayor said, take a look at it after that, after those improvements are made. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Good timing. Okay, thanks. Uh, before I start my uh, comment, uh, it's. It's been a while since I came here last time, and it's nice to see that there's a conversation going on between the trustees, mayors, and the speaker. Uh, my name State is your so. name. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. My name is So. I am one of the core members of the Stop ETO and Lake County group. I want to bring up a few points regarding ethylene oxide. First is about their test results, and I understand not all the results are out there yet. It's unfortunate that despite the fact that we repeatedly raised the concern regarding the limited canister locations and duration, our voices were not heard and it was conducted minimally. So the amount of results is very limited. Out of nine days of data, which was uh, four locations each in Gurney, as far as I can tell, only one of them was directly on the path of the wind. Not surprising that really the number was high, was 1.1 microgram per cubic meter which is 55 times higher than what EPA considered to be actionable limit. Even taking out the background level, you can see that this number is alarming. And however, I did not see any information about this in the latest Keeping Posted Plus newsletter. It'll be nice to have that kind of information in the newsletter. 
regarding other locations where the wind was blowing in the wrong directions, we won't know what the numbers will be when they are on the uh, direct path of the wind. This gives an excuse to the village, to the companies, to minimize the effect as just as the background level, as you stated on the Facebook post. Many people live northwest and southeast from the Vantage plant. They will never know what they are really breathing every day. Another thing I want to mention is what is happening in other communities. Sometimes the best way to illustrate how Gurney has been handling ethylene oxide issues is by looking at how other places have been handling it. On July 19th, uh, WebMD published news about ethylene oxide issues in the city of Smyrna in Georgia. Of course, they already had a town hall meeting within two, two weeks. It's been nine months since we uh, found out about the ethylene oxide issue, and we haven't had any town hall meeting from the village, from the city, from the Lake County Health Department, from EPA, from IEPA. We haven't had nothing. The only thing we had was the, the permit hearing from Medline. And we had a lot of uh, uh, community meeting by, uh, hosted by us. Second, the mayor of Smyrna ordered air testing within 10 days of finding out. That's amazing. That's quite a bit different from the approach Gurney took. The mayor of Smyrna clearly knows that the first and most important job of a mayor is to protect the safety and health of the residents, and I hope that's the same for this village too. Third, it's clear that different government officials and the residents are working together to resolve the issue. It should be common sense, but when plant is emitting a carcinogen, you have to do something about it. It doesn't mean you can turn off the Vantage plant necessarily, but what you can do is work together with the residents, especially those who really want to ban the emission like us. However, uh, I believe Gurney <coughs> slash Gurney Mayor took the opposite approach. Uh, you, you call us mis uh, misleading, spreading misinformation, uh, maybe laughing at us in the background, stuff like that. Basically, the village of Groni made a con conscious effort to minimize the issue, or so it seems. And if that's not the case, that hasn't been communicated to us. So there's a communication issue. I'll say this once again. One of the most important jobs as a mayor is to protect the safety and the health of the community first. The last thing I want to bring up is the Medline stack permit hearing that is coming up on Thursday. And obviously Medline is in Waukegan, but the, when the stack height goes up, the ethylene oxide will spread further, which means more ethylene oxide will come to this village. So um, I hope that uh, one of you will be at the permit hearing. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to see you there to oppose the permit of the higher stack. Thank you. Thank you. Since nobody else is talking, I will. I'm Diane Sirofka. I've been a resident of Gurney for 31 years. And I just want to dovetail with what So was saying. Two things. When people are talking about the canisters, I don't know if the other residents know how big the canister is. It's the size of a two liter bottom of the bottle. <laughs> Blow into that. We've got, what, 10 of them around that whole factory? It's hard to capture data. Number two, the height of these stacks going up so says it's going to disperse further. The current dispersal factor for Vantage right now exceeds beyond the tollway. We are in the death circle. Great America and the Lodge are included right now. If that height goes up to 80 feet, it goes beyond. And I don't think that our residents know about that. And that's kind of important. And it's important, too, when we're looking to bring in a third major player in Gurnee as a, a tax revenue body, that when we're going out and soliciting people to rent in that space, that they also be aware of it. And I mentioned that before. When you sell your home, you have to disclose everything that's wrong with the house. And my mom and I did. It's the same thing when you're coming in as a potential uh, business merchant in Gurney. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Crawford. I am a Gurney resident 
and I spoke to all of you at the beginning of January, and I begged you to conduct independent air testing to see what the levels of ETO were in our community. Finally, five months later, the air testing began in June. Now, as you know, we've received several rounds of results, and what we've seen so far is high readings from both Medline and Vantage. The first point I would like to make about the testing is that we all knew Medline would be coming in very high, since they do not have their controls in place yet. Obviously, this is very scary, and I don't want my family breathing these high admissions every day. The second point I would like to make is that Vantage already has their controls in place. So in theory, their results should be extremely, extremely low if they are already capturing all of the ETO admissions. But the results are not low. One day, it was at 0.61 micrograms per cubic meter, and another day, it was at 1.1 micrograms per cubic meter. As So already did the math for us, this is 55 times higher than what the EPA deems an actionable level. Also, we have to remember that these test results were only yielded with four canisters located around Vantage, and the wind patterns were not blowing in the direction that the EPA wind modeling told us it would blow. So, just imagine how high the tests really would have been if we had had more canisters around Vantage to capture the emissions any way the wind was blowing. The third point I would like to make about the air testing is that we also have seen a lot of ND results, which mean no detect. It is very hard to believe that 35% of the testing results were NDs, especially since the US EPA Region 5 has told us that they believe there is a background level of 0.1 to 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter already in Gurney's air. So therefore, we know that these NDs are not accurate that something went wrong with the testing. It's not acceptable for Gurney, Waukegan, or the Lake County Health Board to let GHD give us these invalid test results. You use taxpayers' hard-earned money to pay for this testing. For example, if I'm paying my money to ComEd for electricity, and I didn't really receive electricity for 35% of the year, that would be completely unacceptable. As a paying customer, I would be voicing my complaints, and I would get compensated for it. We have waited months for these test results, and now with 35% NDs, the results are inadequate. It's Gurney's, Waukegan's, and the Lake County Health Board's responsibility to voice their complaints to GHD and get compensated for it by, with additional testing. Next, I would like to move on and ask the mayor and the trustees how they are going to protect the residents from these high ETO admissions. Now, I know that many of you sitting up there believe that these are the urban levels of ETO and that there's nothing to worry about, but I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the high levels from Medline that blow over Gurney residents' homes and schools. I'm talking about the high levels from Vantage, which is already has their controls in place, that they are right next to Gurney homes and schools, homes such as my parents that are located one mile from Vantage. I remember Mayor Kavorik said that she was in touch with the mayor of Willowbrook when the news first came out about ethylene oxide in Gurney. And I certainly hope that you've, you've stayed in touch with Mayor Triller. On June 27th, he said, sterigenics can take whatever steps they feel necessary to try and reopen. But as long as they are using ethylene oxide, they are not welcome in Willowbrook. Please, Mayor Kavorik, reach out to Mayor Triller and take his lead in protecting your residents. Don't just ignore this cancer-causing gas by pretending the levels in Gurney aren't that high. Months ago, on the Village Gurney's website, I remember reading a quote by you, Mayor. The quote goes, I am proud to serve as the Village Mayor. I will be guided by your desire for a government that provides quality public services that conserves our village's resources, that invests in our children in future. I need you, Mayor, to stand by your quote. I need you to guide my desire for safe air to breathe. I need you to provide quality public services such as accurate air testing. I need you to invest in my children. 
I need you to be the mayor you promised to be. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Yolanta Bamiatlo, and I'm also here to talk about the ethylene oxide issue in our village and in Waukegan. Um, you know, a lot of the things were already mentioned, but um, to reiterate, concerned community members have been coming before our respected Gurney leadership for almost nine months, demanding immediate action to ban emissions of cancer-causing ethylene oxide next to our homes and schools. Although we are still waiting on the release of the final air monitoring results, I think there's five more days left, uh, left of results to be released, the results that we have seen thus far are incredibly concerning, especially for residents who are very close to, the, to those facilities and for parents who have their children attending schools by these facilities and daycares. Now that the results are out, we have evidence that this mutagen, mutagen is in our air, and we ask that the village of Gurney take the appropriate steps to protect its citizens. Recently, the mayor of Willowbrook um, has stated that his village will exercise its home rule authority to pass a local ordinance to ban ETO. Further, Willowbrook is considering exercising eminent domain to purchase the property on which Sterigenics is located on. So just, just to reiterate, Gurney also has home rule authority, as does the city of Waukegan. So the Willowbrook will be, will be passing a local ordinance. Uh, further, Smyrna, Georgia recently found out about a similar ETO emissions issue in their community. Uh, within a matter of two weeks, a local, uh, the local government leadership in Smyrna organized a town hall forum to address the community's concern. While here in Gurney, we are still waiting for an official meeting for a two-way dialogue on this important issue. Um, it's one thing to come here in front of the village and voice our concerns, but what we need is a two-way dialogue, and that has not ha yet happened um, around this issue. Further, Smyrna has recently announced that they will be conducting independent air testing. All of this got accomplished in a matter of two weeks, and I repeat, we've been here for nine months. We've been coming here for nine months asking for this, and testing didn't, we were still waiting for test results, and it's been nine months. That is a stark comparison about how the response has been between the communities. Given that the mayor will be visiting uh, the Atlanta, Georgia Smart City Expo in, in um, Atlanta soon, which is very close to Smyrna, Georgia, I would highly recommend that during your trip um, to connect with the local leadership and the local mayor there to, to swap notes, to, t to talk about you know, what, what can be done in their community, what has been done in our community, et cetera. We had a meeting with uh, Ed Nam from Region 5. He's the head of, head of the Region 5 EPA, the US EPA, uh, several weeks ago. And he told us that the testing that was designed for the Lake County Health Department was not designed with a 30-day air monitoring. It was designed for 90 days. Given that the testing is completely inadequate because it lacked canisters all the way around the, both facilities, it had a lot of canisters placed on one side of the facility, the wind patterns obviously fluctuate and we're not where we thought they were gonna be. So now we have a lack of data. I mean, we've got high results when the wind is blowing towards the canister, but we also have a lack of data because the wind was blowing elsewhere. Um, I think that's, that's a concern and I think we should definitely look at um, getting additional data points around air monitoring. Further around the stack that was mentioned in um, Waukegan, so Medline is proposing this 80-foot stack to disperse you know, the pollution. Uh, my take on that is dilution is not the solution to pollution. With a taller stack, what is going to happen is more residents will be placed at risk because even small amounts of a known mutagen are very harmful. So ETO is not like another po pollutant. In small quantities, it can mutate your DNA. So now you're exposing communities like Libertyville, Green Oaks, Grays Lake, et cetera, and, and that's not fair. That's not fair. What needs to happen, the right thing to do, is to ban these emissions, not to disperse them further and, and minimize how, how much the community um, gets. Uh, so, you know, to go on Sarah's point about Vantage already installed their scrubbers, what do we do next? They've already added their pollution control. 
what's next? What's a parent to do who has a child at Spalding Elementary School where one of the canisters was relatively high, I think it was like 0.8 something. As a parent with a child assigned to Spalding Elementary School, what I want to know what will get done. The, they had uh, pollution controls in place. What's next? What's the plan of action for Vantage? Because that wind is, when the wind is blowing towards Spalding, those readings are high. What are we going to do next? Yeah, I'll conclude on that as a parent. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor and board, I'm Adrian Doherty. I'm a new resident of Gurney. I'm originally moved here in 2014 to 901 Clark Drive in Heather Ridge and liked it so much I decided to buy my townhome and I'm really loving living there. And then I found out about ETO and how close I am to it. I moved here in 2014 after surviving an, an extremely aggressive cancer, and I almost died a few times in the course of just treating it. And I came here to recover, and then I found out about this. And you don't have to look very far. I went to my oncologist first, then called people at Stanford, called people at Sloan Kettering, called people at Mayo, and several other doctors of mine at Rush, and at University of Chicago and ran this by them. I said, should I, I just bought a house here. What should I do? And they said, yeah, this is not a good place for you to be. Um, all you have to do is a little homework. Mayor, you were at Heather Ridge the other day. Thank you for showing up and being with us. And I asked you on behalf of a lot of my neighbors who are all older they're in their 70s and 80s, and they're all people with compromised immune systems. And they're very, very, very concerned, and they're frightened. And I went to the board meeting on their behalf and asked you, how are things going with Gurney's inquiry, inquiry into the ETO emissions? And you said, well, you know, we're testing and we're testing, but everything gives you cancer. Cars gives you, you know, everything is carcinogenic, and so why worry about this? To me, I did for, not so, for say someone it like that, ma'am, I did not say it like that, and there's a lot of witnesses to I that. Didn't, so I let you, them you make said up that stuff, everything can, you were but dismissive. I did not say it like that. Whatever. That's what I heard. It, it was not a considered response, and I think I'm just pleading with you to take this with the gravitas that it deserves. Uh, Senator Durbin and Tammy Duckworth wrote a letter, which I'm happy to copy you on. I'll shoot it off to you tomorrow, to the EPA about their grievous lack of oversight with regard to ETO and, and the Illinois ETO as well. It is unconscionable how this has not been dealt with in the way with the seriousness it should be. And as a cancer survivor and someone who may not have many years here, I do this on behalf of my neighbors who are too old and too scared to come themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I'll remind the board, please rely on the resources and the experts that we're using, and we're putting that information out on our website. Any other residents that are interested in accurate information, context, and perspective, and the process and what we're going through, we have a special page dedicated to this. Um, I also did talk to Ed and Ann before and after this conversation with Stop ETO, so I, I know what was said. All right, we need to go into executive session. Brian? Uh, this would be under exemption 21 uh, on a semi-annual basis. The board is to review uh, prior closed meeting minutes and uh, we'll need a motion under that exemption. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Motion by Trustee Balmas. Second. Second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll, Roll call please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. 
Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Balmas. Aye. Six aye.